Well, good evening and thank you for joining us on this uh, West Midlands Chemistry Teacher Centre lecture. And thanks again to the RSC and the University of Birmingham for uh, helping to support these, these lectures and also to the WMCTC committee members for enabling this to happen. And of course, your teachers to advertising it and encouraging you to come. So on this session, we're very privileged to have uh, Dr. Peter Hall from the uh, University of Newcastle here today to give a, a revision lecture. And this revision lecture is on transition metals and, uh, and aqueous solutions. Um, Peter is uh, heavily involved in STEM outreach. Uh, I'm, I've been privileged to work with him and, and give demonstrations with him. We're both involved with RSC projects such as spectroscopy in a suitcase, uh, top of the bench, salters, all these other wonderful activities that hopefully we'll return to normal soon. But at the moment, we're doing as best we can online. And so today we've got this revision lecture. Um, uh, Peter will explain about it, but there are uh, ways which you can uh, participate. There's a voting scheme, so it, it will be slightly interactive as well. So in addition to being the outreach officer at Newcastle University, uh, Peter was also a chemistry teacher for 20 years at uh, High Achieving Northumberland School. And he also is uh, an exam marker for A-level chemistry. So uh, he knows all of the tips and tricks about chemistry A-level. So he's got some great advice. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Peter to share his screen. That's great. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Mark. And good evening, everyone. Uh, sadly, of course, virtually this year, I'm, I'm speaking to you actually from uh, um, our PGC lab, chemistry PGC lab at Newcastle University, uh, because I don't trust my home Wi-Fi. Uh, for uh, important presentations like this. So thank you very much for, for joining us uh, this evening. Thanks to Mark for that introduction. Uh, as he says, I'm, my, I have a background as a chemistry teacher. I'm a, I'm a marker for, I can say it's AQA. I'm not allowed to put that in publicity. I can tell you I'm a marker for AQA. Not that I'll be marking anybody's exams this summer, uh, unfortunately. I'm also a practical advisor for AQA. In normal times, I go around to schools that they send me to to make sure, uh, to check up on the teachers that they're doing the practical endorsements with you correctly. Um, so this is a revision session, as Mark says, on transition metals. Um, before I do my revision session, I'm just going to plug one of my colleagues who you might have heard of, a guy called, um, a very good YouTube channel called Mackham Guy. This is run by a guy called James Dolkin, a good friend, uh, James Donkin, a good friend of mine. He's the head of chemistry at Hartlepool Sixth Form College up here in the Northeast. He's from Sunderland, so hence the Mackham. Um, and obviously chemistry, it's a play on words. But James has a lot of videos that he's put online, completely free to anyone to use covering the whole of um, A-level chemistry on every, every conceivable topic. So that's a very useful site you all might almost, you might like to refer to at some point in the future if you've got to prepare for assessments in school or even when you get to university as refresher material, I can thoroughly recommend uh, James's, uh, James's website. So it's called Mackham Guy, just so it's not a website, so it's a YouTube channel. Just, just look up his, his YouTube channel. Now, as Mark said, these lectures are going to be interactive. I'm not just going to talk at you for an hour. That would bore me, silly, never mind you. So I'm going to be able to ask you some questions. If we were live, in fact, if we were live at the university now, I'd be using this same system. I used to bring along little voting pads, but this system is much better because it means you can take part wherever you are. If you're in the same room, you can use a mobile or a tablet or whatever. You can do it wherever you're sitting or whatever uh, now. Yeah, ideally, if you've got a separate device, you can open this up on a separate device. If not, just open another window because when the questions appear, uh, the questions will also be visible on your device as well. You won't need to necessarily keep flipping back to the, uh, the PowerPoint, apart from some of the questions that have a lot of information on. It doesn't show you the information, it just shows you the answers. That's the link, ra.onbia.com, and the session ID is PH10. It's not case sensitive. I wanted PH1 because I'm quite acidic, but sadly I have to have a four-digit code. It won't let me have a three-digit one. Another pun I have is that I have to be a... Um, I have to be a chemist. My initials are PH. I don't have a middle name. Any of you who follow me on Twitter will notice I either put, is it little p, big H, as in acid base, or is it big P, little h, as in phenyl group, because my PhD was in organic um, aromatic chemistry. So I like benzene rings. Not going to encounter many of those today, unfortunately. So hopefully you're all logged into Ombia. Some of you will have signed in before because Mark obviously sent you the information in advance. Let's just give you a quick test question to see if the system's working, and that will include me as well. Oh, there we are, yep, so the question should actually appear on your, um, on your, your Ombia web page, whichever page you're on. Yeah, so I see a few people voting. I'm going to vote as well. Which one of these, only one correct answer, which one's the best definition of a transition metal? I'll vote as well. 
Let's do the voting a bit. Again, I can't see exactly how many people are online. I'm not going to wait, even when I do these uh, live, I don't wait for everybody to vote because some people don't vote. Oh, 82 participants, okay. That's including me and some of the committee as well, obviously. Um, so I won't necessarily work, wait for everybody to vote because uh, not everybody will vote and some people will fall asleep or go off and have a cup of tea or whatever. Um, so I'll just wait for sort of the majority or a reasonable number of people uh, voted. Obviously, this session is being recorded, so I'm sure Mark will, will let you know what the link that will go up on the WMCTC website eventually to be able to come back and look at this and look at the questions and look at the answers uh, at your leisure after the uh, lecture. Oh, it's only been stuck on 51 for a while. A little number in the corner, the green uh, in the green boxes, that's how many people have voted. Just commenting earlier before the lecture started of course doing things remotely always takes longer for the voting to come in because all these all your uh, your answers are zapping through the the internet from wherever you're located so it does take a little bit uh, longer to to come in now, the initial rush of voting seems to have slowed down so i'm going to i'm going to uh, um close polling because every, when i do it, it will take a, a while for the answers to come up again because they're all coming through the internet to my laptop if we're live in the lecture as soon as you zap the answers and I press the button, you'd get the answers instantly because they're all instantly, you'd be zapping them directly to my laptop. You're zapping them to a website somewhere. I'm not sure we're on the era based actually, but that's not really important. I'm just going to close polling. That's box has now gone red. It means you can't vote. Oh, actually, hey, that was very quick. Never had it come through that quick. <laughs> and I do an online lecture with our undergrads, our, our foundation year uh, each week. And it, there's not as many of them as you, and it doesn't take as long to come through for that. So the majority of you have gone for option three. That's good. That is the best answer. Uh, transition metal contains an incomplete D sub level, D sub shell in either the element or one of its ions. The other three statements are all correct, but they're not the definition of a transition metal. Okay, so they're all working properly. Other thing I'd just like to know, because this might influence what I talk about in this session, we may, depending on which exam board you do or did, we may um, miss out some bits because the um, I do whole day revision workshops around the country in normal times. I'm not running them this year. Obviously, in the, in the West Midlands, I usually run them hosted by Wolverhampton University uh, each year, usually in early May. Um, and they, they're generic. They cover all the exam boards. Uh, but I don't cover transition metals in those workshops because the transition metal content varies quite considerably between the different boards. It's probably the one topic that, where the content does vary quite a lot between the exam boards. So most of the topics... Uh, the content's pretty similar, apart from the odd little sort of minor point. The transition metals, there's some significant differences between the, uh, the, the major boards. So I'm interested to know what you're studying, because depending on which answer you give me, there may be some bits we can, uh, we can sort of cut out if they don't apply to many or, or any people. Um, Mark has also emailed you, as he said, the PDF of the revision notes. I would normally give out a paper copy at the lecture. If you've got those handy now, you might find them useful. You'll certainly hopefully find them useful. They're a good summary of every thing in transition metals. We may not look at everything in them today, uh, but there's um, a, it's a useful summary you'll be able to use um, when you're, if you're revising for uh, assessments and so on uh, in school or to, to take to uni with you if you're going to do anything chemistry related. Okay, that's the majority of you. Let's just have a look. Vast majority AQA, that's good. You, uh, you can stay then. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm being... I'm being facetious, everybody's very welcome, because there are a couple of bits of the spec that, on this thing that only apply to AQA, but there's a majority of you are AQA. Apologies to the few of you who aren't, I will mention the AQA only stuff, but not for very long. Okay, so let's crack on a look at transition metals. So we're concerned at a level with not the whole of that yellow block. Again, there's, my, there's our you know, Newcastle periodic table. If we're doing this live, I'd have given you all a free copy at the lecture, but obviously I can't send them to the internet very easily. Um, and it's not that whole yellow block and at A level, you're just concerned with looking at the first row. And in fact, not even all the first row now. When I started teaching in the late 80s, we did the chemistry of every element in the first row of the uh, transition metals. We don't do that now. We just do chemistry of selected elements across that row. So we've already said it's an element with an incomplete or partially filled D sub level in either the element or one or more of its ions. You'll see the OWTTE will appear a few times today, appears very regularly in mark schemes. If you've ever looked at mark schemes or uh, exam board resources, it means all words to that effect. It means you don't need a word perfect definition. You just need to get the gist of it right. So that's what OWTTE means. So electron configurations. So you only have to do the first row because at A level you only have to do for the elements up to element number 36. Um, they all start, of course, AR4S2. 
because you fill the 4S orbital first, the 4S is the first one that comes out of order, 4S is slightly lower than 3D, or you can argue it's at similar level, the 4S is three filled first, then the 3D is filled first, but when you ionize them, you lose the 4S's first, because they, 4S and 3D have fairly similar energy. So you fill 4S first, but then you empty them first when you ionize it. A little tip for you, no transition metal ions in the first row, no ions have any 4S electrons. So if you write an electron arrangement for the ions, for an ion uh, in the first row transition metals, and you have 4S1 or 4S2 in it, we can guarantee it's wrong, because there are no 4S electrons in uh, any transition metal ions in the first row. Um, so they are the number of D electrons that they, uh, you'd expect them to have, back to that in a moment, because uh, there are 10 elements across there. So D1 to D10, D shell can hold up to 10 electrons. So they're what you might expect them to have in the, the ground state, in the, in the uh, atoms, in the element. As you probably know, not all of them necessarily do, which is one of the things you need to remember, the ones that don't follow the pattern. So we're going to have a few quick questions to work out the electron configurations of a, a couple of transition metals and their ions. So which one of those is the correct one for vanadium metal? I should have said at the start, so I should have said to Mark earlier, you, you'll need to see a periodic table. Obviously, if we'd been live, I said I'd have, um, I'd have obviously given you my periodic table, so you would all had one in the lecture anyway. You'll also need a calculator a bit later. We're going to do a little bit of, uh, we're going to do some sums a bit later on in the second half of the lecture. So, um, you don't have to, you can use your, use your mobile phone or your computer, obviously, as a calculator, but you will need a calculator. Um, we've got some, some redox titration calculations coming up in the second half of the session. So, of course, this is the element, so the element's probably going to have uh, four, four S electrons in. These questions didn't used to be useful when I started doing these revision workshops 10, 12 years ago, 12 years ago because uh, there didn't used to be multiple choice questions at A-level at that point. Um, now, of course, there are. You get multiple choice questions at the, in, in one section of each of the papers. So this is now more relevant sort of exam or assessment practice than it used to be for most of the time in running these workshops where there weren't any uh, uh, multiple choice questions in the, in the A-level papers for a number of years. So, of course, you can always eliminate one or two answers from multiple guess questions, as I sarcastically call them, because one or two of the answers are always silly. And then, of course, it's always avoiding the distractor, the answer that you might think is right, uh, but is actually wrong. It's sort of the, the misconception question. OK, that's the majority of you. Unless you've gone for two. That is the correct answer. Yeah, it's the third one along. It's the element. It is 4S2, 3D3. What about chromium? This is where you see it uh, sort of quarter past seven in the evening. Who's, uh, who's still alert? <clears throat> electron configuration of chromium. That's great, you're all answering this one much faster. The votes are going up much quicker, so clearly this has, has rung the bell with a lot of you, which is, uh, which is great. Okay. Yeah, again, the vast majority of you have gone for three. Yeah, chromium is one of the two exceptions. It's not 4S2, 3D4, it's 4S1, 3D5. There's something special about having D5 or having D10, because that's exactly half full or exactly completely full. And so if they're one away from that, if they're D4 or D8, uh, D9, sorry, they'll flip an electron from S to D and they'll be 4S1, 3D5 or 4S1, 3D10. What about the iron two ion? Remember what I said a couple of minutes ago about the electron arrangements of ions, there'll be at least one answer here you'll be able to immediately eliminate as being rubbish. And you can concentrate on the others that might be right.
Okay, crept back up to around 60 again, so we'll stop it there. Yeah, everybody's gone for, almost everyone's gone for four. Yeah, the ground state is 4s23d6. It's losing two s electrons, it loses both of them, it's 3d6. As you know, of course, Fe3 would be 3d5. And as you all know, Fe3 is more stable than Fe2 because Fe3 is d5. It's got a half, exactly half full D shell, and that has some special stability about it that you don't need to have to explain at A-level, and I've long since forgotten why. And finally, copper 2 plus. An iron you're very familiar with. Probably sick of the sight of copper sulfate now by year 13. You've probably made it uh, several times, you know, made it at least once uh, in sort of lower school, and you may well have done some other experiments with it at, uh, at A-level. So which of those is Cu2 plus? So I think my microphone is very directional. It's only pointing towards me, obviously, towards the, uh, the, the laptop. But uh, you can hear a strange noise in the background. It's actually, I've got a couple of Bunsen burners going to warm the lab up because the, the heating in this building is, is not brilliant that I'm in the, uh, in the King George VI building on campus. And I, I, the heating isn't brilliant at the best of times. And of course, they switch it off at five o'clock because imagine everyone's gone home. So uh, I usually have to stick a couple of Bunsens on uh, to produce a bit of, uh, a bit of heat. And that's why I've left my, left my jacket on as well. <laughs> To my own question. There we go. I've just got on be open so I can see that it's the questions are coming up. Um, okay. That's great. Yep, so we've got more people joining us. Good evening. Welcome. Almost everyone there has gone for number three. Again, and it is number three yet. Yeah. 4S13D10, of course, is ground state of copper, but it'll lose that 4S and it'll lose one of the Ds. So just to remind you. Two highlighted in red there. They're the two exceptions for the elements. Chromium is D5, it's not D4. Copper is D10, it's not D9, because they're both one away from being D5 or D10. So they're, they're 4S1. So there we are. As we've already said, they all start AR4S2. Fill 4S first, then 3D. But when you ionize it, you remove the 4S first. And the two exceptions, as we've just identified, for the elements are chromium and copper. They're both 4S1, they're not 4S2. Okay, just to briefly mention something about oxidation states, we'll talk about redox a little bit later on uh, in the, the presentation, oxidation number or oxidation state, but just often get a lot of students asking me, well, how do I know if, it's a sim if, it, if, if it is a X3 plus ion or X, or is it an X5 plus ion or whatever? And the basic rule that seems to work all the time, there's always a lot of exceptions to things in chemistry, aren't there? But the no ions have four S2 electrons is the one that works all the time. And this works for group one, uh, for the, the first period of the transition metals as well. If their oxidation state three plus or less, they will be a simple ion. So v, vanadium three is V3 plus, iron two is iron two plus. Yeah, they're probably complex ions, an aqueous solution, they'll have water stuck to them or some other ligands, but they are the simple ion. They're not, they're not bonded, chemically bonded to, to anything else uh, like oxygen and so on. So three plus and less, simple ion. Four plus or more, you can't, won't form four plus or five plus or six plus ions. That requires far too much energy. The ionization energy is far too high. They will be covalently bonded and they're usually oxyan ions. They're usually the metal atom covalently bonded to oxygen. So there's some classic examples of ones that are probably on your spec. There are other examples as well, but things like permanganate, sorry, manganate seven, dichromate six, VO3, VO2 plus and so on. They don't exist. There isn't an MN7 plus ion with four oxides stuck to it in the manganate ion. It's MN with covalent bonds to oxygen and it carries a negative one uh, charge. So plus three or less simple ions, plus four or more, always one of these oxyan ions like that. They're, they're never, you don't get MN7 plus or CR6 plus. Require far too much energy. Okay, let's now look at complexes because they're a very important part of the uh, transition metal chemistry. So as you know, a complex, you need to be able to define all these, of course. So I have, and they're defined in your notes. So a complex, of course, is a molecule or ion made up from two or more species that can exist on their own. So the metal ion can exist on its own, on whatever the ligands are, can exist on their own. 
A ligand, of course, is anything which, which has one or more lone pairs of electrons. It can be an atom, rarely. In your case, it's going to be an ion or a molecule. So, of course, a ligand in inorganic chemistry, something with a lone pair. In organic chemistry, and I'm an organic chemist by training, my PhD is in organic fluorine chemistry. In organic chemistry, a thing with lone pairs is called a nucleophile. They're exactly the same thing. Just annoyingly, inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry give them different names. But ligands and nucleophiles, exactly the same thing. The generic term for all of them, that again, it's on some specs, but not, not on all, is of course, they are Lewis bases. Okay, a coordinate bond, of course, you all know that from AS chemistry. A coordinate bond's covalent bond formed by the lone pair on the ligand being donated into an empty orbital on the metal ion. So it is a full covalent bond. So if we told you that at GCSE, metals form covalent bonds, that would have freaked you out a bit. But you all know transition metal chemistry involves covalent bonding. The metals are covalently bonded to the ligands. And these are full, full covalent bonds. Uh, they're coordinate bonds, but once they're formed, they're indistinguishable from any other sort of covalent bond. And the coordination number, of course, is the number of coordinate bonds, the number of lone pairs being shared between the metal ion and the ligand. In some older textbooks, they, they sometimes say it's the, it's the number of ligands. It's only the number of ligands if they're monodentate, if they only have one lone pair. So that's not a good definition. The correct definition of coordination number is the number of lone pairs donated to the metal. Some ligands can donate all six. We'll see one later. I'm sure you know about that one already. OK, so the convention for writing complex is to do them like that in square brackets which gets a bit confusing with concentration sometimes because that's also in square brackets. So I presume if you had a concentration of a ligand, you'd have to have square brackets in square brackets, which would be a bit confusing. So we don't tend to give you transition metal questions, uh, you know, in, uh, in rates questions. So you have the M for the metal, symbol for the metal, L the formula of the ligand, N will be a number between one and six, depending on the type of ligand, and it may or may not have a charge. And notice I'm, using, I'm calling them complexes. I'm deliberately not calling them complex ions because they aren't all ions. Some of them are neutral. Some of the ones you know about are neutral. So they are transition metal complexes. They are not all transition metal complex ions. They don't always necessarily carry a charge overall. They've always got an ion, a metal ion's got the charge. Overall, the complex may be neutral. So that's deliberately why I'm not calling these complex ions. So the shapes of them, uh, always a bane to have to remember for exams or for assessments. I was gonna say exams rather than assessments. It's a shorter word. You know exactly what I mean. Almost all the ones you come across at A-level are octahedral. So IED means if in doubt, it's octahedral. But of course, Murphy's Law, what they're going to ask you about in the exam, they're going to ask you about the few ones that aren't octahedral to see if you're awake. So there aren't many. The only ones that are tetrahedral that you come across are the ones with chloride as the ligand, uh, either cobalt or copper or both, depending on your exam specification. The only one that's linear is that one with silver, Silver uh, diamine one, that of course is the active uh, agent in Tollens reagent, the, the uh, um, reagent for, to produce the silver mirror for aldehydes. And the only square planar one, not on every spec, it's on a lot of them though, is that one, cisplatin, uh, potential anti-cancer drug. That's certainly on the AQA uh, spec. It may be on some of the other drugs. The vast majority of you are doing AQA, which is good. So basically most of them are octahedral, but learn those four that aren't, because you can bet your bottom dollar that part of a question will ask you about one of the ones that isn't. So let's look at some of the iron chemistry. We're not going to look at it all in detail because in your notes booklet, there are separate summary tables of all the reactions you need to know about forming complexes and ligand exchange done by specification. So there's AQA, there's OCRA, there's, there's ZXL and so on um, for your spec. And they are, they are current. I check them every year, not the, the specs change every year. They haven't changed for a few years now. Uh, so that's current for your spec. I can make a few general points. If the complex is an ion, it will be soluble. All the complex ions you study are soluble. If it's got a charge overall, it's water soluble. So it will be a yellow, green, blue, pink, whatever solution. If the comp so there's some simple examples. There are many others. If the complexes are insoluble in water, if the complexes are neutral, they're all insoluble in water. Um, you don't need to know it's because of intercomplex hydrogen bonding, uh, but that's why. So complex ions are always water soluble, so they will be a, a particular color solution. If the complexes are neutral, like some of those there, the ones with the, often the hydroxides, the neutral hydroxides, they are precipitates. So you'll see a blue, green, whatever, precipitate or suspension or solid 
So it's important that when you say, what's the color of this compact junction? It's green, it's gonna be green either solution or green precipitate. It needs one of those two words after it. If it's an ion, it's soluble. If it's not an ion, if it's neutral, it's a precipitate. So reactions, there's various different types. We're not gonna go through them all in detail, just to remind you, there's acidity of metal three plus versus metal two plus. Metal three plus are acidic, metal two plus are not, apart from copper. Uh, simple ligand exchange, replacing one ligand with another. Ligand exchange with changing coordination number. There's only one example of that that you commonly come across. And then something called the chelate effect. We're gonna look at each of these in turn uh, briefly. Again, you've got full notes on all of this in the revision um, notes booklet that, uh, that Mark emailed uh, out to you. So acidity, most of you are doing AQA. So I will briefly mention this, apologies to the few of you who are not doing AQA. This is only on the AQA spec, uh, I believe uh, currently. So metal three plus ions are very small and highly charged. They're highly polarizing. They can distort water molecules sufficiently that they actually dissociate, the OH bond actually dissociates and they lose H plus as in that equation on the right there. And so the H plus of course protonates water. And so we get the hydroxonium ion H3O plus which is what causes things to be acidic. You don't need to remember these numbers but for metal three plus it's about one in a thousand that does it. So that's 10 to the minus three. So that'd be a pH of three. That's quite reasonably acidic. Metal two plus, it's the same metal. It's only two plus ion, it's only lost two electrons. So it's larger, the charge is more diffuse. Metal two plus are not as polarizing as metal three plus. So they can't polarize, distort these OH bonds in the, the water ligands anywhere near as much. It's only one in 100,000 roughly that dissociates. You don't need to remember these numbers, but you can see it's, a, it's an extra you know, factor of 100. So a solution of metal two plus, is only gonna be around pH five. It's a much weaker acid. And in fact, metal two plus solutions are not usually strong, in, strong enough acids to react with uh, carbonate, for example, and give, a, give, an F, give effervescence. There's some acidity equations, which you will have to know how to write each of these if you're, if you're uh, sort of AQA. The first two steps, either water or base will do that, OH minus. The third step to produce the precipitate uh, you, water won't do it. Water is not a strong enough base. Well, water is amphoteric, but it's not a strong enough base to do that. You need a base. You need OH minus or ammonia. Ammonia is a weak base, but ammonia is good enough to pull that third uh, proton off the waters. Remember, this is not ligand exchange. It's not OH minus replacing the water. It's OH minus deprotonating the waters that are the ligand. The net effect looks the same. It looks like it's a ligand substitution, but it's not. It's an acidity reaction. It's the base taking H plus off the water ligands. Um, so with OH minus, say strong base, uh, drop wise it acts as a base, excess it still acts as a base. You'll get ligand substitution, you get the, you get the precipitate, then some will dissolve to give a solution with more OH in, some don't, they remain as the precipitate. Again, look at your summary table. Ammonia is a weaker base, drop wise it does act as a base, the same as OH minus, does exactly the same reactions, um, produces a precipitate of the uh, hydroxide in the first instance. But if they dissolve in excess ammonia, that is then a, a, a ligand substitution. It's the complex with four or five or six ammonias, and that will be a, um, a transparent coloured solution. Car um, and as I mentioned briefly there, carbonate is a very weak base. And so the products you get with carbonate, you don't get carbonate as a ligand. It depends on the uh, acidity of the metal ion. Metal two pluses, you just get a precipitate of the metal carbonate. Even copper, uh, copper two plus is not a strong enough acid to produce effervescence with carbonate. So you just get copper carbonate. So all the two plus ions give a precipitate of the metal carbonate. All the three plus ions, they are, the solutions are acidic enough. You will get um, effervescence of CO2 and you produce a precipitate of the metal hydroxide. So for all these, you need to be able to write balanced equations potentially. I'm not showing you those, we're not doing those today. You've got examples of them in the revision notes. I'm trying to show you where there's some patterns in how these things behave, because a lot of students always used to say to me when I used to teach this for 20 years, oh, this is really difficult to serve. I've got all this mass amount of information to learn. So I tried to sort of break it down into, well, no, there's actually patterns in the way things behave here. You don't have to learn a huge, great table. You can condense it down to about half a dozen pieces of information you need to remember. There are some patterns in here, except for the colours. I've never spotted a pattern in the colours. So if you spot a pattern in the colours, please let me know, because I've never spotted one in 30 years. I'm not saying it isn't one. So there's an example of simple ligand exchange, just replacing water with hydroxide. And initially you get the blue precipitate of copper hydroxide. 
And of course, that does not dissolve uh, in excess, the precipitate uh, remains. Uh, I can actually show you some ligand exchange happening here by looking at some nickel complexes. So here's some solutions with some nickel complexes in. This is a nickel uh, hexaraqua, six waters, and we're going to do a, a ligand substitution on it. So here's the nickel complex, uh, six waters bonded to it. I'm going to substitute two waters at a time with a bidentate ligand, ethylene diamine or 1,2-diaminoethane, you'd have to call it, or it's often called EN for short. So let's show you doing the first one. The first beaker is going to stay as a control. Uh, what would happen is we replace two of the waters by ethylene diamine, and we should have seen a blue solution in that second beaker. I just hope it was that video. One, of course. Oh, well, there's the result. You can, you can see the results each time, even if the video doesn't play. That one's blue. We're now going to replace two more ligands with uh, water ligands with ethylene diamine. And that one's still not going to play. Sorry, folks. Don't know what's going on there. And that would have been indigo. And hopefully you can spot a pattern here. Green, blue, indigo. There we are, it's indigo. And usually now everybody gets the color of the last one. Uh, even reception kids in primary school, when I do this as part of one of my other lectures called Colorful Chemistry, I don't do transition metal revision with reception kids. Uh, but when I do a revision, I do a, another lecture called Colorful Chemistry, I do this demo, you'll all be shouting violet at me now, because it looks like the last four colors of the spectrum, green, blue, indigo, violet. I know it was given me by one of my now retired academic uh, colleagues. It's the only reaction I know where you can stepwise replace one ligand at a time and get a different color change each time. That doesn't normally happen. This is very rare. Normally, as soon as you start to substitute one ligand with another, you just get the colors uh, of the, the, the final product, the final complex. So the complex where it's got two, three, four, five, or six ligands replaced is always the same color. This one isn't. It's just obviously because of the energy gaps of the d orbitals in, in nickel two plus. It doesn't work with anything else. I've tried it, I've tried it with copper two, iron two, iron three, cobalt two, all the other common transition metal ions you would study in A level. It doesn't work with them. As soon as you tip the EN in, it just goes to one other color and stays that color no matter how much you um, arrange. This is a, a unique property of, of nickel. I mean, nickel chemistry isn't on the A level spec anymore. No, you don't do nickel chemistry. It used to be on Excel until a couple of years ago. But this is a very nice demonstration of stepwise replacement of a ligand and getting a different color. There's the chemistry. And just to remind you, of course, that these, with these bidentate complexes, you're probably quite familiar with this. If you have a, a bidentate complex with two bidentate ligands and two monodentate ligands, like the uh, nickel H2O2 EN2, that can show cis trans isomerism. That doesn't just occur in alkenes, it occurs in transition metal complexes as well. I'll show an example in a, in a slide in a moment. And the tri-EN1 actually has optical isomers. It has a pair of optical isomers, which again, I'll show you uh, in a moment. So there are the cis trans, trans isomers of, of nickel. So this will be with any complex where you have two bidentate ligands and two monodentate ligands. They don't have to be EN and water, but it needs to be two bidentate and two monodentate. You can see there the, oh, it's got, it's labeled them. There we are. The one on the left is cis, these are both octahedral, of course, and the trans one is where they are both directly opposite there in almost like a square planar arrangement with the waters top and bottom. So they are two uh, isomers of these type of complexes, and you're sometimes asked to identify those uh, in exams or in assessments. And the, th the three uh, ligand, three bidentate ligand ones actually have two mirror images like that. They are not superimposable. If you try to twizzle one round and put it in front of the other, you'll find one has the EN group pointing forwards, the other one has the EN group pointing backwards into, into space. They're not superimposable. They are genuine uh, mirror uh, images. And these are 3D structures from the CCDC, the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, um, because 
Oh, okay, it must be on the next slide, apologies. Just to briefly mention then two important biological complexes um, that you'll be very well aware of that contain, actually one of them doesn't contain a transition metal, but they are important biological complexes. One, of course, is the thing found in the red blood cells of all animals, allows transport of oxygen. You all know that's haemoglobin. There's a the structure of haemoglobin. It's an iron complex. So for those of you studying biology, you'll go into the, the sort of science, the biology of haemoglobin in quite a lot of detail. It's, it's not Fe, uh, it's actually Fe3 plus iron in the middle of haemoglobin. That's why blood's red. That's why it's the same colour as rust, because rust is iron three oxide. It's got the same iron ion in it. And the other one is found in plants, the catalyst of photosynthesis. We've all known this since primary school. That's chlorophyll. Uh, chlorophyll's actually got magnesium iron in it. Now, magnesium, it's Mg2 plus. Magnesium's not a transition metal. This chemistry's gone off the spec now, but magnesium does form complex ions, even though it is not a transition metal element. So does lithium because those ions are quite small and highly charged. Again, that spe that's gone off the, sp the specifications now. Nobody studies that at A-level, but there are one or two main group elements like beryllium and uh, magnesium and lithium that do form complex ions, even though they are not transition metal. The compounds aren't colored though, and the compounds aren't good catalysts. They don't have all the properties of transition metal. But if you glance at those two complexes, you can see they're pretty similar. Um, the main, uh, the, uh, the, the bits hanging off the side chains are a bit different. They've got a different metal in. They do a completely different job. One's in animals, one's in plants. But you can see they're structurally quite similar. So there's a couple of important biological complexes. And there are others. Now, this is what I thought was the previous slide. You've got a link to this. You don't worry about scribbling it down in the, in the index page of the re revision uh, guide that has been emailed out to you. There's the link for this and, and two other resources I'll mention at the end. This is a chemistry one. You can look at real 3D uh, X-ray crystal structures is what that uh, this structure is here that's aspirin that's an actual 3d crystal structure x-ray crystallography gives you the 3d structure of molecules and you can use this to um uh, look at we've produced loads of worksheets on all these topics anywhere where 3d structure is important in chemistry including shapes of transition metal complexes so those images i showed you for the nickel en complexes cis trans and, and um, optical uh, they came from this, uh, this website. It's free to access, and all these resources have been peer produced by A level students like yourselves doing a summer Nuffield project with me uh, at the university or remotely uh, last year, obviously, with the, uh, the lockdown. They'll be remotely this year as, as well. So there's the exchange with changing coordination number. It's the uh, hexa aqua going to the tetrachloro. I wanted to show you this demo because a load of textbooks say that that copper complex is green, uh, is yellow. It is not yellow, it's green. I see a load of websites that say it's yellow. I've seen textbooks that say it's yellow. I've even seen the exam um, mark scheme say it's yellow or yellow green. It's green. And if I could do it live in front of you, it's green, it's lime green. It only appears yellow if you haven't added enough HCl because a combination of green and blue will appear yellow. So if it appears yellow, you haven't added enough HCl. If you add HCl, conch HCl to excess, and it has to be conch HCl, doesn't work with sodium chloride, that complex is green. It is not yellow. And I'm sorry I couldn't make the video to, to prove it to you, but I say even some textbooks and stuff have it wrong, or they go yellow, green. They're sort of edging the bets, really. It's bright green. If I did it in front of you, it's lime green. And the chelate effect, as you know, when you replace a unidentate ligand with multidentate ones, there's a large increase in entropy, and those ligands, are, are, those complexes are very, very stable. The best example, of course, is a hexadentate ligand EDTA. So EDTA is a single ligand, six lone pairs it has on it. And of course, if it use copper as the example, if you complex uh, copper two with EDTA, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, reaction because EDTA is hexadentate. It can use all six lone pairs. Uh, it makes this copper complex, which is very stable. And that's because you're breaking six carb copper oxygen bonds with the water. You're forming four copper oxygen bonds and two copper nitrogen bonds. So overall, delta H is going to be approximately zero. It's going to be a very low value. You're breaking and making pretty similar strength and types of bonds. The, a CUN bond won't be much different bond energy from a CUO bond. So the overall enthalpy change for this is very, very low. But of course, you've got a massive change in entropy. You're going from two moles to seven moles because you're releasing, whoops, lights have gone out in the room, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, Eco-friendly university. If I don't move too much, the sensor doesn't realize I'm here and it turns the lights off. So I've plunged into darkness during the daytime, doesn't matter. So we've got a massive increase in entropy here, plus, plus five, because we're releasing, we're putting one ligand in and releasing six. So massive increase in entropy. And because of that equation, of course, 
Delta H is very small. It's approximately zero, a very, very low number. Delta S is very large. So Delta G is going to be very negative. It's a very positive Gibbs free energy. This is going to be a very feasible process and it's going to be very stable. You aren't going to reverse it the other way and go from seven moles back to two. And hopefully again, if I'd been able to do these demonstrations for you, I would have shown you this. I'd have made this copper EDTA complex, which is a blue solution. I'd have tipped loads of sodium hydroxide in. We would have seen no precipitate at all of copper hydroxide. You will not displace EDTA by any monodentate or bidentate ligands. The, the driving force, the entropy to, to keep that uh, complex is very, very strong. It won't revert. So there are some patterns to learning these reactions. You need to look at the specific ones for your specification, whichever uh, board you are doing. But there are some general rules that I mentioned earlier. For example, every uh, aqueous ion you do gives uh, a precipitate of the metal hydroxide when you add dropwise NaOH. And when you add dropwise NH3, you get the same thing. You get a precipitate of the metal hydroxide. So there's X number of reactions that boil down to one. They all give a precipitate of the metal hydroxide. They'll do something different with excess NaOH or excess NH3. So you need to remember those one or two examples. But there we are, all with dropwise NaOH and NH3 give a precipitate of hydroxide. All the, all of them, all two, on some specs it's only one, all one or two that react with concave CL all give a solution of MCL4 2 minus. Because it's only either cobalt or copper. It will be one or other or both, depending on your specification. So there are some patterns. You've got specific examples in your booklet that, that you've been provided with. There's a summary table of the actual colors and shapes and formulas of each of the complexes. And then there's my set of condensed rules of what you actually need to remember to remember all that information in the table. So except the colors, I've never spotted a pattern in the colors. So redox titrations this is sort of the penultimate uh, part. Um, we might just do one calculation, bearing in mind the, the time and I'll skip through the second one. These, of course, work the same as acid-base ones, just the stoichiometries are more unusual. Instead of one to one or two to one or three to one, which is all you'll get in an acid-base titration, you can get weird ones in redox. You can get five to two. Uh, no, it's uh, 10 to seven. It's 10 to eight. Boom, boom. Um, you can, sorry, my jokes don't get any better. Uh, you can get um, three to five. There's, there's one that's three to seven. I can't remember what it is. I remember I used to set it for my students to balance at A level, it's a redox, two redox half equations, and the balanced one was three moles of one to seven moles of the other. And I cannot for the life of me remember which, which system it was. I'll have to dig out my old uh, A level file at some point or other. So remember the three steps. Again, there are other ways to do this, more than one way to skin a cat. So if I show you a different way here than you uh, use, or you've been taught to do these calculations, that's fine. More than one way to skin a cat. As long as you get the cor correct answer in an exam, whatever method you use must have worked. That's how we mark calculations. We look at the right answer. The answer's right, you get all the marks. I'm not encouraging you to put the right answer down, though. Far from, well, I'm encouraging you to put the right answer, but not just the answer. Far from it, always show you're working, because if you do make a silly mistake in exams and assessments, like even very bright students, very able students who can do these calculations standing on their head normally, you can make silly mistakes in exams and assessments that you don't make any other time. If you've got your working set out, we can see where you might have made a mistake, one mistake carried forward is allowed. If you, if you get step one wrong, you work out the wrong number of moles, but you apply that wrong number of moles correctly to all the other steps of the calculation, and A2 calculations often have four or five steps to them, you will score all the marks at bar one. It's called consequential marking. If you just give me a wrong answer and nothing else, you're going to get zero. So always show your working. I'm sure your teachers have hammered this point into you for a number of years, even, even at GCSE. But my method is the how many moles three times or other ways to do it. This is a standard one. Work out the moles of the one you know, often uses a titer. Use an equation to work out the moles of the other one it's reacting with, and then convert that into the required answer. So step one and two are always worth a mark each. Step three could have several parts to it, depending on what you're required to work out as your final answer. So I'll show you a quick example here. I think this is the same one you've got in your booklets, actually. So there's a quick example, 25 centimeters cubed of a, a oxalate. I'll say oxalate, it's easier to say than ethane dioate. Um, reacts with 22.7 of 0.2 molar manganate, calculate the concentration of ethane dioate. So the moles is the manganate, so CV over 1,000, or however you want to work it out, uh, it's 4.54 times 10 to the minus 4. There's the equation, it's uh, 5 moles to 2. We've got the 2 moles, the manganate, we want the 5 moles, so we've got to multiply it by 5 over 2, it's got to be bigger, that's how I remember which way around the ratio is. So it's 1.14 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of uh, oxalate, 
Concentration then is 1000 N over V. V is 25, given in the question, and you just worked it out. So it comes to 0 0.0454. I've left it as a decimal. Often get students asking me, do I have to do it as a decimal? Do I have to do it in standard form? You can quote it either way, unless RTFQ, read the full question. If it says give it in standard form, you have to give it in standard form. If it says give it as a decimal, you have to give it as a decimal. I've rarely ever seen an A-level question where it says give it in standard form or give it as a decimal. What we want is to the appropriate degree of accuracy. And mm, fudge should say there, notice this is to three decimal places, three significant figures. You know that's the default, isn't it? Minimum three sig figs, unless we tell you anything different. So here's just one for you guys to have a go at. There are actually got two examples. What you do here is you type your answer in. Don't bother putting the units in, because if you type different units in or you leave a space, the computer will think they're different answers. Just type the numerical value for the final answer into the, uh, the box there. And this will show the five most popular when we close polling. We'll say there's two examples of this, but we'll just do the one because I'm conscious of, uh, of time. I'll then break out of my PowerPoint. We do have a section on electro potentials, but that's going to take too long to do. I'll zap out of that and we'll just go at the end one on as a very short section on catalysis, which has got a couple of videos in, which hopefully are going to work. But of course, while you're looking at this question, I can't go and advance ahead in the PowerPoint and uh, see if I can get my videos to work. I've got no idea why they're not. I have used this PowerPoint before with my with our undergraduates last September as revision and it worked fine then. So if you just type a numerical answer into the box, uh, obviously you'll have to do it as a decimal because you can't really write this in one only disadvantage on B, you can't really put something in standard form. Um, but don't put any units or anything after it. Uh, because then it'll count it if you put units in and, or, and if you, you leave a space and somebody else doesn't leave a space, the uh, system will count that as two separate answers. The important thing is you quote it to the correct uh, degree of accuracy, which as you know is minimum uh, or usually three significant figures unless the question tells you something different. Yeah, what I'll do, I'll find out what the problem was with this video. So I'll get the videos working and I will, I'll send Mark the PowerPoint and hopefully there may be, the WMCTC may be able to put the whole PowerPoint on the, uh, um, on, on the website. Or if not, I'll just send you the videos and you can put the videos on. It would be nice for you to see them because uh, they're the last section we're going to do for the last sort of five minutes. Um, I'm going to show you um, a couple of examples, uh, an example of each of the two types of, of catalyst. Because um, transition, we've already said transition metal is a very good catalyst. So the final section I'm going to briefly look at after this question uh, is to look at uh, catalysis. And I do have a couple of quick video clips that are about a minute long each, uh, showing you each of the two different types of, of catalysts um, actually uh, working, a couple of demonstrations. And if the video doesn't play, I'll sort that out afterwards. I'll either send Mark the videos or I'll send him the, the PowerPoint with the videos working. I'm sure we can find some way of, uh, of making that available to you. I'm just having a look at the, uh, the chat while you guys are, are answering this. Uh, a couple of questions have come up. Someone said, is the equilibrium sign essential in AQA? That's where you're doing the, um, uh, that's the, I think the formation of the um, uh, metal aqua ions. Um, I'd say yes, because you, you, you will know, of course, that acid base systems are all equilibria, aren't they? You know, Ka and so on. 
So those acidity equations I was showing you, they, they do need to be equilibrium symbols because they are, they are equilibrium processes. You can shift them one side or the other by changing the concentration or changing the temperature, like, like all acid base uh, systems are, are equilibria, um, aren't they? Uh, what's the M mean? Sorry, that's me, capital M, that's because that's I'm, I'm old. Capital M, it means the same as mole per decimeter cubed. I hate writing mole per decimeter cubed because I'm male and I'm lazy. So I write capital M, it would be quite acceptable if you put that in an exam. Capital M is an accepted symbol that, rep, that means mole per decimeter cubed. I just write capital M because it's easier to type one letter than try and type six and have to do superscript. Uh, but capital M means molar, moles per decimeter cubed. It's a, an accepted alternative to, um, uh, to putting mole dm minus three. And it's a lot quicker than putting mole dm minus three. So sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I've been used to doing that for a very long time. So apologies, I should have, I should have mentioned that. I just, I just take it as, as red. Um, so yes, uh, someone said the recording in the PowerPoint. Yes, Mark will put the recording of this lecture onto the WMCTC website at, at some point in the next um, few days or whatever. And I'll say, I'll hopefully I'll um, get the videos working uh, and then send Mark a copy of the, the PowerPoint and hopefully he'll be able to you know, put the whole PowerPoint up on, on the WMCTC website. I'm sure he'll probably, probably email you when he's, when he's done that or Mark will be able to tell you at the end of the presentation in a, in a few minutes time. Oh, tiny URLs aren't working. Oh dear, what I, I don't know what I've, I don't know what I've, I don't know what I've done there. Then I shall have a look at I shall have a look at those afterwards. Thank you very much. They should be correct. They were working when I typed them in. Do you mean they're not working when you click on them in the PDF, or they don't work if you actually type the URL into a into a browser? Oh, now that's worrying. I understand them. They're not. They're probably not hyperlinks. They probably don't work if you click on them in the PDF. But if they're not working at all. Um, that's a bit worrying. I'll look into that. Thank you. Unless the tiny web, unless the tiny website's temporarily down, which I'm, I'm not obviously going to look now. But thank you for advising me of that. I'll, I shall have a look after the lecture. All I can surmise is that, that they are the right links. All I can surmise is perhaps the tiny website's down for maintenance or something. It's, it's American. Um, so perhaps the Chinese have hacked it or something. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so I will look into that. Sorry. Right, that's a number of you voted. I voted as well. Hopefully I got the answer right. This will just give the, the most five most popular answers. Hmm. Did I come out with, oh, there we are. Apologies. Oh, there we go. The most popular answer, good, is 0 0.0353, because that, there should be a tick on there. 0 0.0353 is the correct answer. Uh, Apologies for that. Some of you just quoted it a bit too accurately. 0, 0.35, 5, I don't think would score. That's only two significant figures. It needs to be minimum of three. You might get away with 3, 5, 3, 2, 5. That's five significant figures. You can argue about what the limit, limit is. It needs to be minimum three. We're having a philosophical argument about whether five is too many. The other answers you've clearly gone wrong in the calculation there somewhere. This is actually the method. That's the number of moles of manganate. It's a five to two reaction again. So that's the number of moles of peroxide, and that is the final answer, 0, 0353 M, mole per decimeter cubed, no time to correct the three C figs. You better look at this at your leisure when obviously you get access to the PowerPoint. And there's a second question that I'm not gonna have time to do, but you can have a look at it at, it at your leisure and it's got the question, it's got the answer. So you can, you can try and work it out yourselves. I'll skip past this bit, I've obviously talked far too slowly. We'll very quickly have a look at, uh, just to finish off uh, catalysis, and I'm hoping the videos are going to work. So there are two different types of catalysis, of course, there's homogeneous and there's heterogeneous. Homogeneous are in the same phase, same state, heterogeneous are in different states. Transition metals are good at both, being both type of catalyst. So a catalyst, of course, is something which increases the rate of a chemical reaction by providing an alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy, and it's recovered unchanged at the end. Um, homogeneous, of course, are in the same state as reactants and products. The catalyst does take part in the reaction, usually by changing oxidation state and back again. So of course the transition metals have got variable oxidation state. They're very good at doing this. They can lose and gain electrons. They've got multiple oxidation states. So that's why they're very good chemical catalysts. The disadvantage of them is you often need equimolar amounts. You need one-to-one -one moles of catalyst with reactants. You need a large quantity of catalyst. And of course the catalyst is in the same state, same phase as the reactants and the products. You've got to then separate the products from the catalyst, which is obviously more 
tricky. So not surprisingly, industry would rather not use homogenous catalysis if they can help it. There are a couple of examples on the AQA and NXL specs. I'm not going to go through those now. They're, on the, uh, they're in the revision booklet. And hopefully, if this video is going to work, show you a catalyst working. Oh, I think so this will show you. I love this demonstration. It's one of my favorite ones. This shows you a catalyst actually working. That's potassium sodium tartrate, not particularly important. So apologies, I'm very slightly overrun. I've got about another two minutes if you can all bear with me for a bit. So I'm also going to show you an example of heterogeneous catalysis after this. I'm just pouring some warm water in because the solids don't react very well. It needs to be uh, dissolved up so the particles can move around. So that's just some warm water that will give it a bit more energy as well. It'll react a bit quicker. This wants to react and produce carbon dioxide gas. So we should see effervescence. These don't write fizz in A-level assessments, but a large number of students do. It's got to react with something. It's got to react with hydrogen peroxide. This is 100 volume. So 100 times stronger than a hairdresser would use to bleach your hair blonde. You wouldn't want to put that on your hair. It will bleach it blonde. But it'll snap it off at the roots and take your scalp off. Um, I haven't been using peroxide. I've just had a haircut since I filmed this last week. So I've got less hair now since I filmed this last October. Ah, oh dear, very cheesy. I've forgotten my catalyst. Here it is. It's cobalt 2 chloride. It's one gram dissolved in a bit of water. This is going to speed up our reaction. It is going to take part. You'll see a color change as it, as it undergoes a, a redox process, but it will revert back to pink at the end. So I'm now legging it out of the way. And you'll now see why it's sitting in a tray. Again, needs a few seconds to overcome the activation energy. I think there's that's a, you can clearly see that's a bit more vigorous um, reaction. Now you can see why I've got the tray. You can see it's green in the middle because it, it changed oxidation state to catalyze the reaction. Please pay close attention now to the solution at the bottom of the flask. It's reverting back to its original pink color because the catalyst overall, of course, is unchanged. And so if I pick it up, hold it against the sort of lighter background of the back of the lecture theater there, you can see the catalyst is recovered unchanged. I put one gram of catalyst in. If I evaporated that water off, I'd get one gram of catalyst back. Of course, you well know, because catalysts can decrease in activity, they can be poisoned, but they aren't ever chemically destroyed by the reaction. They're not consumed in the reaction. That's the chemistry. The cobalt two turned to cobalt three. It's the redox process. It gave an electron to the reaction, but it got its electrons back at the end and reverted back to pink cobalt two. But it certainly did take part in the reaction. I get rather annoyed when I walk through some classrooms and you get non-chemistry specialists writing on the board at GCSE, catalysts speed up reactions and don't take part in them. Of course, they take part, they're lowering the activation energy. And finally, then heterogeneous, just to finish off, um, page seven, they're in different phase, different state. Usually the catalyst is a solid and the reactants are either liquid or often in industry gaseous, of course, the reactant can just pass over the catalyst. Uh, product can be taken away very easily. So industry like heterogeneous catalysis, you can do a continuous process and the catalyst doesn't, get, doesn't contaminate the product. The catalyst provides a surface, Surface area is an important factor. So you can use a, a powdered catalyst or vastly increase its surface area. Actually, you don't use a powdered catalyst, it will blow away. If you can vastly increase the surface area by putting it on an inert support. And then of course there are issues with the active sites becoming poisoned by impurities. So you have to make sure that your reactants are very pure going into heterogeneous catalysis. So there aren't impurities that will block the active sites and make the catalyst less effective. They take it out and clean it about once every four years. They're doing the harbor process anyway. There are some examples mentioned in the notes, not going to talk about them now. Final thing I'm going to show you then hopefully is a, a lovely example of heterogeneous catalysis, and that's the demonstration, which ironically also uses hydrogen peroxide. I get through gallons of hydrogen peroxide. So it uses detergent. I have to use fairy because fairy soap was invented in Newcastle upon Tyne in the 1840s. Sadly, fairy soap's no longer made, but fairy liquid still says Procter and Gamble Newcastle upon Tyne on the bottles, but sadly it's not made in Newcastle anymore. But Procter & Gamble, or P&G as they're now called, Global Research Centre is just outside Newcastle. Here's the catalyst. It's manganese dioxide, MnO2. A lot of teachers tell me, oh, I try and do this. It doesn't work very well. You have to have precipitated MnO2, which is about 50 quid a bottle. It's not very cheap, but it lasts a long time. You could get it back out and reuse it if you wanted to. And I like stripy toothpaste, so I'm going to put some stripes in. I'm going to put some red stripes in. I'm going to put some blue stripes in, so a bit like sort of Aquafresh. Other brands are available. I'm not sponsored by PNG or Aquafresh. So there we go. A lot of people like to do elephant's toothpaste with KI, potassium iodide. That's not really a catalysis reaction, but it, uh, 
younger kids think it's great because it all comes out brown with the iodine and looks like poo. So of course they all find it highly amusing. I think this one's a lot better with nice colored stripes in. This is my 100 volume peroxide again. Let's tip it in. It's going to be the decomposition of peroxide is going to be catalyzed by the MnO2. So it's got to be uh, precipitated MnO2, granulated or just ordinary powder doesn't work. The obviously surface area isn't large enough. And there we are, there's loads of toothpaste squirting out the tube. It's not really toothpaste, of course, it just looks a bit like it. And elephants are big, so they need a lot of toothpaste, even though they've only got four teeth. And there you can see it coming out with the stripes in. You might just about be able to see some water vapor coming off the top there. This is actually quite an exothermic reaction. You wouldn't want to stick your hands in that foam. Might have some unreacted peroxide in. And also the foam is, uh, is quite hot. It's boiling some of the water that's being produced. Um, but those bubbles have got oxygen in. I'm not going to show you that. When I do this with younger kids, I get a lighted splint and stick the lighted splint in. That's uh, a glowing splint in and relight it because the bubbles are oxygen gas from the decomposition of the peroxide. But that is a genuine um, heterogeneous catalyst. The catalyst was solid. The, the reactant was a liquid uh, hydrogen peroxide. There we go. There we go. So it's powdered, so it's got very high surface area. Just to briefly mention, once I say too much about this, the links, which apparently aren't working, I'll look into this. I don't know why they're not, unless I've typed something wrong. I'll, I'll check it after the lecture. That's a resource. Again, the links are in your booklet uh, for uh, both biology and chemistry, anything to do with biomolecules, DNA, proteins, enzymes, and so on, for both biology and chemistry A-level. Again, all peer produced by A-level students like yourselves. And finally, this one, just for A-level biology, it was produced last summer. Uh, on lipids and anything connected with lipids. That's purely a biology project. Just a colleague who used to work at the Protein Data Bank moved to the Lipid Maps Data Bank, which is in Cardiff. But these are all UK-based um, worldwide databases. The first two are in Cambridge. This one's in Cardiff. So that's a, a biology resource, uh, anything to do with, with lipids and, and uh, related stuff. Very relevant at the moment because, of course, viruses and how to destroy viruses because they've got a lipid biolayer and how to break it up using soap. So all very, all very relevant. And we're developing some chemistry stuff for this, this summer. Okay, sorry I overran a little bit there, uh, folks, and the videos didn't work. Obviously, uh, my technology's failed me again. So I'd like to thank the WMT, WMCTC committee for inviting me to give this lecture, uh, Mark, for, for hosting through the facilities of University of Birmingham, and for my university for letting me come and speak in my time off in an evening. <laughs> or use the use the premises. But more importantly, yourselves. I hope you found something useful. Apologies, the videos didn't work, and I very slightly overran. I will sort out the PowerPoint um, that uh, I can send that to Mark, and he can make that available to you through the WMCTC website or whatever. And good luck with your. Uh, apparently, I've been told now they're not they're not called CAGs this year. They're called TAGs, Teacher Assessed Grades. Well, whatever they are, good luck with them. And I hope if you are going on to university in the autumn, I hope you all get where you want to go. And thank you all very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent revision lecture and also for the resources as well. Um, I know it's like sometimes the videos don't work, so don't worry. Uh, if you send the PowerPoint to me or send the videos, uh, when I put the recording of this up on the on the Cambridge site, linked to the WMCTC, I'll also put the, the PowerPoint so people can watch those videos as well. So that's not a problem. Or actually, if you send them to me, I can um, embed them in the, the video. Either way, we'll get the resources to you and then uh, email you so you know the links. Um, so the link is still there for the PDF. For the, those of you that haven't got the revision guide as well, uh, that link is still, still valuable there. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, do you, uh, are there any questions? So lots of thanks. I don't know if you can see the, the, the chat, Peter, as well, but... Uh, I can, I've put it up now, Mark. Thank you, yes. Excellent. So yeah, lots of thanks come in, which is great. Um, I don't know if, you, I think you answered most of the questions as you went along, actually. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say in answer. I just to picked up there. Why do we times it by a thousand at the end of the uh, the titration calculation? That's because the... Vo the um, you need to convert it uh, into decimeter cubed and your volumes in centimeters cubed. So I always use that N number of moles is C V over a thousand. C is concentration, V is volume. And I always put the thousand in because it does the conversion for me. If you just remember that N equals C V, you've got to remember to divide your volume by a thousand to get it into decimeters cubed. So at okay. the end, if you're working out uh, C, C is a thousand N divided by V. You have to have the thousand in Otherwise, your answer's coming out in, uh, uh, in mm, moles per centimetre, not mm, moles per decimetre, wrong units. 
Essen, thank you for that. And um, well, I'd like to thank Peter once again. I think he's on tour because someone said that they're going to see you tomorrow as well. Are you uh, are you giving some schools lectures or something? Then I'm I'm doing a, a presentation. I'm doing colourful the colourful chemistry lecture, which will have those nickel complexes in. So hopefully, in fact, it'll, it'll have those two. Uh, it'll, it won't have elephant's toothpaste in. It's got the nickel complexes in, and it's got the catalyst in action in. Uh, I'm doing that a presentation for WMCC, but hosted by Wolverhampton University tomorrow afternoon. Excellent. Well, I hope that. I goes thought that was aimed at younger students. Obviously, a few older ones have nicked in. <laughs> <laughs> that was aimed at years eight and nine, I think, isn't it, or key stage yeah. three or something? But fine, more the merrier. <laughs> Excellent. I thought it was. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. But uh, no, thank you once again, and for all those uh, that are going to see Peter tomorrow, but also check out on the WMCTC website because that gives the upcoming lectures as well. And um, I'm just starting to populate the links for registration, so those will be open as well, so you can look ahead to the uh, to the venue ahead. Um, well, I'd like to thank everyone once again. Thank you, the committee, and especially thanks to Peter as well for giving up his evening and giving this really useful revision lecture. So. Thank you all once again, and I, uh, I look forward to seeing you to the next events. So thank you very much once again. I don't know whether uh, any of the other committee members have any announcements or would like to say anything before people disappear. No, just thank you, Peter. And uh, of course, yes, you've already mentioned uh, tomorrow afternoons, particularly for the younger, but hopefully if any of the students are not in lesson because they've got study periods, they might like to uh, watch in. Yes, that's lovely. Thank you.